Uh, greetings, Fred Roll, uh, Clary Owned Tribal Council member from Dillingham, Alaska. Uh, I wanted to address a few things. Uh, I appreciate all the comments, overwhelming support, much appreciated, all, all the kind words. Um, as far as cursing, um, I mark my videos uh, as I'm uploading them, not intended for children for a reason. Um, if adult language it, it bothers you, maybe. You know, and that's the beauty of it. Freedom of choice. You know, I'm not forcing you to listen. So, if that offends you, well, uh, not my issue. Um, uh, by all means, I want you to enjoy, but I don't muzzle myself for anyone. You know, if, if that's what you're here for, uh, you came the wrong guy. I don't, I don't bend, I don't break. So anyway, now um, that being addressed, I, I am going to be uh, filming some of these shares outdoors. Uh, the reason I can't right now is this particular laptop. When the last time I tried to film, it was just a, it was washed out. That I, I just got this cheap thing just for uploading. I, I'm not a tech guy, so it's not like I'm sitting in front of some multiple thousand dollar computer. I, I got this little cheap Lenovo Idea Pad Pro or some bullshit, um, just to. Uh, I'm I'm not a YouTuber per se. Uh, I'm a carpenter and you know Alaskan dude. This is all new to me. Um, I enjoy sharing, though, because I feel people need to hear these things. We have 500 to 2,000 people missing up here every year. Not a joke. I'm not saying they're all hairy, man. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying a lot of them are unknown and never seen from again. Um, not unknown people, but unknown why they disappeared. So, anyway, I, I'm going to, as the channel moves forward, I'm compiling missing persons reports right now. There's uh, 139 active bulletins as of like uh, two weeks ago was the last time I checked Alaska Department of Public Safety um, I, I'm, I'm weeding through those for the ones from remote Alaska and looking into the circumstances to see if there's any correlation from experiences we hear of here and how that transpired not not to cast aspersions on that situation but just to make a comparison kind of compare notes and see check the what-ifs because some, something's going on anyway so uh, today I'm going to share with you uh, something that uh, this guy, his, his real name's Glenn. I'll leave his last name out of it. Um, he used to be a big game hunting guy. He, he worked with a pilot and they would work in, in unison. He would take the hunter out, do the hunting, the pilot would fly him in and out. You know, hey, he, he liked being outdoors anyway. So they were on a sheep hunt. Uh, I believe he said Brooks Range. <coughs> now... They were going after this beautiful full curl. They've been chasing it for like three days. Anyone been sheep hunting? You know, oh geez, eat your Wheaties, man. Eat your Wheaties, and don't think you're gonna get, you know, a two, three hundred yard shot. <laughs> you're not. You be prepared for five, six hundred yard shots. Sometimes longer if you got the skill. Anyway, so Glenn's taking this guy, and. For the first couple days, they keep spotting it at a distance, but whenever they would try to get within any kind of shootable range with the wind conditions and the weather, this thing was just gone, like a ghost. And they're like, damn. All right, we'll try again tomorrow. So this goes on for a couple days, and finally, it was on day, uh, I believe he said it was the morning of day four on a 10-day trip. Uh, there was caribou and potentially wolves on this guy's little package deal he was doing, right? So they dedicated the first part to get the doll sheep. He wanted full curl. That was his main point. And then the, the caribou wolf thing would be a secondary. You know, but he, he won it all. You know, he's paying good money. He really does want it all. So so Glenn's under the pressure to get this guy on a on a on an animal. So the same same thing. Morning of the fourth day, he starts glassing up high as the client is actually cooking. Um, the client, the client loved to cook, and so he was basically camp guy. He was always on top. I, I think it was a form of OCD. Glenn said the guy had to cook, made sure everything was cleaned up, yeah, which is good, you know, which is good. Especially it lightens the workload in in remote Alaska. Trust me, after a day of hiking around in that shit, dude. Trust me, you're beat. I don't care how much stamina and how tough you are, you're beat. And anyone says they're not, you're full of shit. So <laughs> anyway. The morning goes on he's glassing and, and things are just getting done and and he remembers getting this feeling of being watched now where they're where they're tented out there's only 
alder shrubs and willows and stuff there's no big timber okay um there, there's timber south of them and they can see the tree line off in the distance but they're not around any cover they're they're kind of in a windswept open place down at the base of this mountain in this valley right across the valley there's a string of trees that that thickens up as it goes south below them that meets up with the other one so i'm just trying to give you a layout and so he's he's glassing up the one ridge and he's like man there's just nothing and and he the last spot was it just you know just up this mountain so he's wondering he's like well i wonder if it's on the back side and, and he's just doing hunter stuff just contemplating animal movement you know and he's trying to deduce whether or not he should try the back side of the mountain in front of him or just let's find another full body full curl gram across the way there across the valley and as he was contemplating this sounded like a wolf howl in the distance from the trees just south of him um he said the trees were about 700 yards before they started to thicken up with any kind of density and so he hears this droning long what he assumed was a wolf howl but it just kept going and going like he was like what the hell is he was looking at the client who was looking at him like for guidance like what is that dude and the guy's like wolf of some kind maybe it's it's giving birth or something he was just throwing shit out because none of it made sense this howl shouldn't be going on like that for so long but it sounded like it was south of him so he said he just whatever it, it's not here so whatever it is is over there and we're armed so and maybe you'll get your wolf ticket before we get the dull sheep you know and so the client's like yeah that'd be cool whatever you know i just want to shoot something you know trophy hunter whatever uh i i get it i don't do it because i when i kill i want to eat so i i stopped um killing large predatory animals unless i have to um anyway so his game plan they're going to try the back side of this particular mountain they had been stalking for a couple days following this ramp now on the back side of where it was he said there was a couple draws below them once they came over the ridge and started down the other side there was a long draw that came up right off to their right and kind of ended where the rock slides down into it and then there's this craggy path that the the sheep take and there was another basically a slide it was a draw um about uh he said it was about 500 yards further down on this path but from their vantage point no trees and shit they could see you know they could see the the two draws the one right immediately in front of them and the one further up <laughs> so they're they're over this ridge and they're starting and they're getting to the top of this first draw and they want to look down the draw and see if there's any animals that were just milling around and maybe you know get one down low and he was thinking, man, I, I hope we don't come across that bastard where when my client shoots it, it falls off a cliff or down in one of these draws. He, d he didn't want to break the horns, right? And the guy's a trophy. You know, he's bringing a trophy hunter that wants his trophy. So he's trying to accommodate. But you get your shot when you get your shot, you know? Anyway, so they go along. Nothing in the first draw. They saw some debris and stuff, you know, from the, you know, the previous winter's, uh, avalanches and, and slides and whatnot and as they're coming up now it's taking time this is this is craggy up and down little off balance rocks jettison out uh you ever trip on those trails and land on your knee yeah you know, dude dude ow uh, that's all i can say ow so i have a torn meniscus in my right knee because of that shit so they're going along and and he sees movement he sees a flash of movement and he's excited because it's on it's on their level it's on their plane you know and typically you want to be below these sheep and they won't startle as easy and they'll stay closer but if you're on their level or above them they they'll get the hell out of there but if you're below them you should be okay and be able to get at least a little closer to get that shot uh, anyone's been hunting that they know exactly what I'm talking about so uh he, he starts working them and he's he's getting his client to calm down they he, he doesn't have full-on confirmation of a shootable ram but he he knows there was movement and, and there was a white and a brown flash and whatnot right so he he's got the eye he, he knows it's just just further up and the way this path goes it kind of comes out a little bit and then kind of cuts back out of view before that next draw comes so it, it, there's kind of a little bit of a corner as you come around and then the draw comes up from there so from their vantage point when he initially saw the flash he knew 
that potentially that ram would be just around that little bit of a corner and hopefully just above them a little bit to where it didn't spook. Now, he, he's well versed, so uh, he's you know on point with this hunter and he's like, look, this may be our only shot at this one. We don't want to have to go all the way across the valley and go up those other mountains. We don't want to get skunked and you know let's just let's take it easy don't don't panic you know it's just just coaching him you know talking about hey you can do it don't panic i have no confirmation but let's see what's around this corner so they they're low and quiet they do their thing it was about another 50 yards before they could get around this corner and, and get a visual of this little bit of how it kind of bowls around before the draw comes up and as they do they come around he's looking and, and sure enough is that full curl Big bodied, he full bodied, so he he, he kind of ducks back. Um, the wind wasn't against them, but it wasn't in their favor. Cause if if he was if he was to stick out around that corner for too long, the way the wind was coming, it could potentially it could scent them and be gone. So he he was cognizant of that, and so he's explaining this to the hunter. When you go around this corner, go low, stay low and as tight as you can without your barrel shooting the rock accidentally. You know, make sure you're clear of the rock before you take your shot. It's the one. You can easily tell it's a full curl. It's legal. Let's get it. Okay. Guys, uh, I guess he had been hunting several times, well versed with his rifle. I think a 300 Ultra Mag. So he gets over there and sure enough he gets out. Bam! Perfect shot. This thing just crumples. And unfortunately, tumbles, hits the path, and and is kind of doing this little death kick thing, and its back legs kind of kicked a little bit as it was doing it, and that that little inertia rolled it off, off the path, and down into that draw. So this this trophy hunter watches this thing go boom, 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 down into the rocks. Now they got freaking work ahead of them for one. They got to get down to it. For two, they got to get back out of there and drag it back to camp. So they know they have a lot of work ahead of them. So during the course of all this happening, they ate up a good half of their day with just a hike up to the ridge, getting over the ridge, and then starting back along that path next to those two draws. So they ate up a good portion of their day doing this. So, uh, Glenn says, hey, I'm famished. I don't want to start this recovery mission right this moment. The temperature's cool. There's no predators around. We should be good. We'll leave it here until morning. We'll come back for it, dress it out, get it out of here, and then we'll we'll go get that caribou and see if that, that wolf is still around. Client's like, okay, that'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> they get back to the camp. Client's already on the cooking thing. He's all over it. And as this is going on, he was talking about, hey, that was a great shot. One shot, one kill. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of having to shoot animals for clients and this and that. You know, he's having a little rant with the client, proud of him. He did his job, yes. And, and the client's, of course, like, yeah, I'm, I'm cooking us some good mood, you know, some good food tonight or whatever to celebrate uh, my first, you know, full curl. And uh, as they're talking and, and, and chatting it up, honestly having a good time at this point, be it successful. They hear that droning wolf type howl, but this time it was a little different and it wasn't quite as long. So Glenn was like, "You just keep cooking. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab the spot and scope, and I'm gonna go down over by next to this little rise where it kind of has a little clump, small clump of trees or whatever. I'm gonna get up behind it, get up to the edge of that, and and see what I can glass across the way there at those trees. Something's over there howling. I'm I'm curious if it's actually a wolf. Maybe it's caught in a snare." Maybe, you know, maybe we can go over and dispatch it and just leave it for the trapper so it's just not sitting there suffering, whatever, you know. So he takes the scope and he goes over there and, and he's spotting along the tree line, spotting along the tree line, sees nothing. Now, after he's done looking, he, he must spend 30, 40 minutes just trying to figure it out because periodically it would, it, it, it would happen, but it, it was like it was moving around in the trees or whatever. So he finally gave up interest and was hungry. His belly was calling him. He got whiff of the food. He went back to over to the camp. When he gets to the camp, he hears that same long, drawn-out howl kind of sound coming from just on what sounded like just over the ridge where they had come from where the sheep was. So now he's concerned. He's like, oh, no. Oh, no. Hopefully... Hopefully uh, the wolves ain't on to that. 
And by now, there's not enough time with daylight to safely navigate up over that ridge. I'm not talking, you gotta understand, when I say up over the ridge, I'm not just talking like a, a leisurely hike. Da, da, da. No, it's, it's freaking work, man. You earn it. You earn it. When you go sheep hunting anywhere in the mountains, you earn that shit. So he knew he they weren't going to be able to do nothing about it. So, bam, immediately he's stressed. He's like, oh, shit, man. I don't want to lose this thing. I don't want to lose it to some stupid freaking wolves. But then he thinks, well, maybe they won't be able to get to it easily. And when we get back over to it first thing in the morning, there will be a wolf near it. Two tags filled, right? Yeah, see? So... And I understand, and when he was telling me, I could tell he was, you know, in the moment when he was expressing it to me. So, and I, I understood. They, they eat, and just as they're going to sleep, the client wasn't worried about it. He's like, there's no way those wolves are going to get down in that draw. There's just too many big boulders. They won't navigate it. You know, he was real, you know, real confident. He just got his one shot, one kill, you know. And so he had a small bottle of Crown Royal. Or actually, I think it was a fifth. Anyway, regardless, the guy breaks out and offers some to Glenn. Glenn was like, well, hell yeah, you know. So they, they start sipping on some Crown Royal, and they they got this, they had a little cook stove, and they started a little fire. There wasn't a lot of trees to burn anyway, so they had broken pieces of whatever in a nice pile, and they had a secondary to add to it, just a little ambient fire, you know. So they get that going, and, and they're sipping this, this Crown, and they hear that howl again. This time it's not over the ridge. It's back down by the tree line, but for some reason, it's a lot sharper and a lot louder, a whole lot louder. And then they hear over the ridge, one similar, but it was off. It sounded like a deeper baritone type with the high-pitched squeal on the finish. It, it was, he said it, he couldn't put it into words. So I'm assuming it was like, Ooh, ee, you know, kind of thing. I, I don't know. I wasn't there, and he couldn't really express what it was but it was it was off it wasn't of the natural sound of the environment and so he's he's concerned but now they've been sipping and so they start bsing with each other like oh oh yeah yeah sure some 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 wolves they they got onto our kill and now they're bragging back and forth to each other he didn't know for sure it was a wolf he just wanted to keep the client cool because the client seemed a little concerned but wasn't, but was, you know, that kind of deal. So he placates to the client and just says, no, nah, those are wolves and they're just talking to each other. It's no big deal. From the distance again, louder and it sounds closer. Now it's getting in the dark. Uh, it's still fairly light, but the shadows are becoming more and more pitch black. Hold on one second here. Sorry about that. I had to uh, reference the email for the sequence from this point. So they're, they're feeling a little bit of a buzz. They're, they're exhausted from the hike, so they're not polluted drunk or anything. So the howl continues, and it, and it seemed like it moved a little closer, but then all that, that kind of stuff dissipated, right? And so they were exhausted. They racked out. They, were, and they wanted to get up extra early, use headlamps to start their journey as it got lighter and make it there sooner. To hopefully avoid these wolves because dudes started getting concerned just before they racked out about the condition of the sheep. They already knew it was bruised to shit going down in that draw, but you know, he, he wanted you know, he wanted it for a mount or whatever. So anyway, they rack out and just as Glenn gets up, he had an alarm set for four thirty. And he gets up just before the alarm and he hears he hears um, tinfoil rustling. So he figured the wind uh, their leftovers from the meal that the client had cooked, they, they foiled over and they left on the stove to heat up first thing and eat and go, you know, they, they were ready, but they didn't want the food in their tents for a grizzly to come by and snack on all of them, you know, so they had it just, just away from their, their camp there, but they didn't have no trees around to tie it up into, so they, they separated a little ways, so he's hearing this foil and, and he's trying to figure out, well, my tent's not shifting with any wind. There's a slight breeze, but the breeze was higher. It, was, it wasn't it uh, was directly hitting them, but they could hear some, some wind blowing up higher. 
So he, he's sitting there listening. And he goes, oh, I'm just going to look out. Why, why am I sitting here? And just as he was about to unzip his tent, his little alarm goes off. And it kind of startles him, you know. And so he shuts his alarm off. And when he does, he no, he hears a commotion outside. And it sounds like a person running away. So immediately he's like, who the hell? So he, he unzips. He, he goes out. Now, it's, it's getting lighter, but it's still fairly dark but he sees this dark figure just beelining towards the little little brush that he had spot uh spot uh scope spotting scoped bleh, the day before at the how so this thing goes past it and he noticed that he couldn't make it out but it was he he could tell it was on two feet very dark and a whole lot taller than those shrubs that he was spotting from now he was on right up on these particular little um, alders or willows whatever they happen to be and he knew exactly how tall they were and they were just a hair taller than him and he's 6'4 this thing towered over that bush as it went past it so he knew it was something big but it was too dark to make out um, he wasn't uh, a hairy man believer he he's a guide you know he had never seen anything ever and this happened mid 80s i think it was 86 87 so somewhere in there he he no longer after this trip he no longer guides uh, i think he's well he's just not in alaska anymore we'll leave it at that i think he's in the in the same profession though so <clears throat> he wakes up the client tells him what had just happened and the only thing missing from their food was actually the food it looked like big fingers scooped what was there out because the the dried or the cold grease and everything it left this smear that looked like four really big fingers and it was a 16 inch frying pan and he said the fingers the the swoop of the fingers took up most of the the interior space of this frying pan so it had to be a massive hand and there was no teeth marks or claws in that and so him not ever seeing that before he took it as tongue licks four individual long tongue licks this thing licked it up and he's trying to you know because he really didn't see much dark figure running away looked appeared tall but light can be deceiving you know he, he could have been waking up out of a fog he, he was you know dismissing it so they let it go so much for breakfast i'm not eating what's left in there i don't know what's touched it or licked it Ugh, you know so the the client says i'll whip up something real quick it, it's not we don't have to cook it but in my pack i have some old breakfast burritos they're about three days four days old now from the other morning that i had saved i have four of them you're welcome to two and glenn's like yeah solid they eat their breakfast burritos and, and they're getting their their packs ready uh their pack boards ready rifles ready and, and they're gonna go light and hard they're gonna go light and hard get up there get over the side get back down into that draw and retrieve his animal <laughs> plans ready headlamps on away they go now as they get up over the top of this ridge now there's there's no tree cover there's craggly rocks and shit but there's no tree cover so when they get over the top they they run immediately into a wall of wind because the wind was coming it was variable at that point so when they come over the top of it they're they're hit by a little bit of a gust that they didn't have on the back side of that ridge right so you know he tucks his hat a little bit he gets down and, and they cut back onto the path they were on the day before to follow it around and then work their way down this draw uh he had a game plan because there was a certain spot where he felt they could navigate and negotiate down and then get over into the draw to retrieve that animal he didn't want to have to go all the way back down the ridge back towards the south hook back around and then come back up this craggly valley with all this you know god only knows what kind of obstacles were that way so they were kind of in a hard place as far as recovering this animal. Clients directly behind him, almost holding on to his windbreak as they came up over that hill, because uh, it took the it took his breath away the way the wind gust you know blew across his mouth. He was you know so so he he just reached forward and grabbed a hold to get his attention so he wasn't left behind. Uh, for whatever reason, the client was really uneasy that day. As they anywhere they moved, he he would get right up on Glenn and Glenn at at this point when he grabbed his jacket, he was like, "Hey, calm down! I'm I'm right here in front of you. 
what's going on? Are you having any issues? He, he was thinking a medical issue. You know, this guy wasn't a spring chicken. And he had been running them hard for freaking days chasing this doll sheep. So he, now he's getting concerned he's going to kill this guy. <clears throat> and just running him around the mountain, right? And I get it. I, I'd be concerned, too. That's a serious liability. You know, that, that doesn't look good on a brochure. Well, we hunt so hard, we'll kill you. You know, so anyway, I digress. So he's concerned about the client. He discussed, hey, are you all right? And the client's like, something is watching us. And he goes, what do you, they're, what's watching us we're the only one we're the only predators around buddy he goes where where do you feel is watching us from and he goes back over the ridge where we just came it was watching us there was something dark off to our right it was watching us and i felt it and and glenn was like well what do you mean did you see it because now he's thinking about what ran off that morning and it not not a whole lot of time had happened since that happened so this thing may have run south and then hooked back around towards this ridge where they're now on right so he get he gets concerned because this guy never freaked out about weird noises the whole four or five days they were there solid guy solid wilderness guy obviously been there and done that but now dude's panicked dude dude's really uneasy glenn says hey have a seat let's drop our pack boards and stuff you take a rest chill out for a minute i'm gonna go back over the ridge and i'm gonna do a little investigating and the guy grabs him by the arm as he's trying to walk by us and he looks up at him and he goes be careful dude there's something over there there's something over there so glenn was like yeah yeah i'm good man i got i got my rifle we're good you hear me shooting just come and help you know and, it, and okay so the guy sits down he's just kind of enjoying the view and you know, feeling the breeze blow past them or whatever, and Glenn goes back over the ridge where they just came and starts back down, little switchbacks and craggly rocks until uh, the partial little scrubs and shit were forming because they weren't quite up at towards the peak of this mountain, but they were just at this ridge where the tree line ended a little bit below them or what trees and shrubs there were, and then it was all open. So he, he got to a point to where he can scan the area. And he's not he's not seeing nothing he's not he's not getting a weird feeling one iota so he just says now nah, let's get this sheep we'll get him and we'll go we'll, we'll have the pilot take us to a different area further down or further up just out of this particular area and we'll look for the caribou and wolf in that area you know let, let's just let's just get this squared away and we'll go so he gets his mental game plan as he's coming back over the ridge and when he comes over the ridge, the client is standing up, and his client's got his rifle, and he's aiming it down into that first drop. <laughs> now, from their vantage point, there's a, a sheer drop, and then from that, that sheer edge, they could see across down to the other side of this draw, but they can't see what's immediately past this edge, right? And so Glenn standing there, and he goes, what the hell are you, what are you aiming at? And the guy was like, something's peeking his head up every once in a while from right down over there. And I was trying to get a look at it. Can you make out what it is? It keeps doing it. And so with his naked eye, he, he looks around the client. It's getting lighter, but it's by no means, oh, perfect vision light. You know what I mean? It's still it's still kind of dark-ish, uh, shadowy, you know, that type of deal. So he, he looks around him, comes over next to him on the path, and he's looking. And sure enough, he sees this... this this thing sticking this it's what appeared to be a big head out at about 350 400 yards roughly so he's like well oh, that is weird you know what is is that he thought maybe there was a piece of something stuck against the rock and the wind would blow it out so it was given the appearance of something peaking he was again dismissing it so he takes a few steps to get a better vantage point he puts a bead on it looking through a scope and when he saw it peek out, it stopped. And this thing made eye contact with him through a scope immediately. It didn't look around for him. It immediately came around and was like it was looking right at him. And, and Glenn couldn't make out like the facial features, but he could tell that it was a, a human-like face. And he was immediately disturbed. Uh, stumbled back was just like what the you know what the hell is that and the client saw what he saw and he said it was looking right at you it was looking right at you should we shoot it and and immediately glenn's like don't don't shoot it 
We don't even know what it is. Don't don't be winging shots. If you know, don't make me take your rifle. You know, the guy the guy was like, "What the hell?" Because he was creeped out from the backside of the ridge, and now this thing's peeking at him. So the client's not happy. He is. He wants. He wants nothing to do with this situation anymore. He starts telling Glenn, "Hey, hey, I can get a sheep next year. I'm not punching a tag. We can just get a sheep next year. Someone, will, something will feed on that. We'll just take the L, and we'll get out of here." And Glenn was like, well, "Let's see what this thing is. Let's see what this is. Uh, maybe we can get a picture of it." And so. They're discussing back and forth what they're going to do. And finally, Glenn says, you wait here, cover me. I'm going to walk down a little further, but I won't go around the corner, you know, which uh, however distance it was where they made their kill shot on the on the ram that fell down. He goes, I'll get to a vantage point to where I, I can see where the ram landed and take a look to make sure it's still there. And then we'll reassess and I'll see if the one in this draw runs away or does something else, right? So he goes along, and once he gets to where he should be able to see where this thing was peeking from, nothing was there. Nothing. So he's like, what the hell? And he goes, all right, man, am I tripping? So he continues down a little ways to get the vantage point to see where the ram was laying. So when he gets to the vantage point and looks down, there's no ram. There, there's blood markings on the rocks, and then he could see from one rock to the next, there was a little bit of blood, and then nothing. He couldn't make out anything more from his vantage point. So he gets back to the client and goes the ram's gone we're gone they get the client's game clients in the lead back over the ridge they're going down and as they make their way back to where it, it's like scrub shit scrub brush a little bit of tundra mixed in little patches here and there it's before it gets into all out tundra it's just sporadic kind of kind of vegetation growth once they reach that point the client's looking in the direction of camp, and he can see camp. It's not hiding. It's out in the open, in the grass, you know, on the tundra or whatever, right over there, a distance away. But he could see it because there's nothing to block his vision. So he's taking a breather, and he takes a knee, and he's he's got his rifle barrel in one hand, and he's down on one knee, and he's going to use the rifle to stand back up, you know, like a walking stick. And Glenn's standing directly behind him, surveying the same way he is, and Glenn notices that bush where uh he had did the spotting scope the day before or whatever um it looked like it had been torn up uh it, it looked he said from that distance he tried to scope with his rifle but it was a little, it wasn't out of range but he wasn't close enough to get enough detail but he could see the fresh breaks he could see the the bark and the the tree material the fibers just kind of frayed out you know this is like man that is freaking weird so they continue on. They get back to camp. The client starts cooking. Uh, he's trying to block out what just happened, and he's reassuring Glenn, hey, I'm not mad. I saw what you saw. Something's going on. Don't know what. Don't know what we saw, but I ain't saying I ain't saying shit. Uh, we didn't see a ram. I didn't shoot a ram as long as you agree with that. I'm not some kind of wanton killer just going to dismiss and leave a kill, but it's not there, and I don't want to look for it. What do you say? You know, and, and Glenn's like, no, it, no harm, no foul. Yeah, we bagged it, but we didn't get it. So it, it'll just be whatever. It was only one. It's not like they were just out shooting everything they saw, you know. So they were they were okay with that portion of it. Now, the guy starts cooking and immediately changes subject. <laughs> Doesn't want to talk because Glenn was like, what did you see when it was peaking? And he goes, whatever it was, I could tell I was looking at you and then continue doing what he was doing. So he, he figured he'd leave it alone. Now, his curiosity for that bush, since he's a lot closer, kicks up, so he scopes it again with his rifle and can't quite make out. He can't quite make out there's something back behind that. And, and he can't make it out, so he's thinking, well, what if it's one of these things that broke this stuff down and now it's using it as a blind to watch us? I don't like that thought. So he grabs his rifle, says, hey, I'm going to go check out the broken bush while you're cooking. Guy's like, hey, bet, whatever. Yell and holler if you need me. I'll, I'll, look, I'll keep an eye out for you. So he gets over to the bush. It takes him a minute because it's not like just a few steps away, you know. So he gets to it. And this, this thing and just whatever, you know, the hairy man just ripped this thing into tatters, you know. And some of those branches were back on the opposite side of the bush. So it, it was thick enough to where he had to go around to fully see what was going on. Now, when he got around the back side, it was part of the ram's body 
but it looked like it had been drawn and quartered, ripped into pieces. There was no gut pile. There was no head. And it was like uh, pulling something apart, its guts drop out and its head go missing, and then it's only held together by little tatters of skin. He said it was all connected, but it had been literally ripped apart. Um, like something just massive just tore it into tatters and made sure it was still sticking together, threw it down and then covered it with some brush. That's what it looked like. No head, no gut pile, and uh, there was just very little blood. So wherever this happened, it happened somewhere else, and now the, the rest of the carcass is here. He looks at it and looks around and he notices deep, huge impressions, uh, foot-shaped, impressed in the tundra, and he's just like, ooh... He, he didn't have a tape or anything, but he laid his rifle next to it to kind of gauge a measurement. He made a mark on his rifle stock and made a note. He'll measure how big that track was once he gets back, you know, where he can get a measuring tape. Um, and it ended up being 21 and a half inch. Um, he accounted, he only measured not from the top because Tundra will pull down and it'll appear bigger. But if you look into it, you can see the actual track sunk into the tundra so he, he used an actual measurement as close as possible so he was nothing else happened by the way uh, I'm sorry I kind of jumped ahead a little bit no, nothing else happened he didn't even want to touch the tattered what was left of the ram um, he kind of threw the branches that were still loose kind of and covered it up a little bit more and then started it went back to camp um, they had been anticipating the pilot coming in two days prior so the pilot not coming in he's already two days behind uh to do a quick check as it was supposed to be coming through to drop off another hunter somewhere else so the pilot hadn't made that uh made his way to them yet but he was expecting them any time now alaskan weather causes weather delays when you're hunting all the time so no big deal and within a couple hours sure enough it, it was getting on to where he figured okay he's coming in a little later so he must be going to stay the camp with us overnight before flying out the next day and and sure enough it's what he anticipated so his partner flies in lands hey how's it going any luck nope you know they they were deadpan nope they was simultaneous they both said nope we're ready to go do we have time to maybe fly somewhere else real quick before it gets too dark to fly and they were packed up and ready and and the guy was like uh, yeah, we got about two hours uh, of we could, you know, pick a different spot. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's load up. Let's do it now. Let's let's move on the light, right? So they do. They jump in, fly off, and he ended up filling all three of his tags. Um, the the wolf tag he got down really last minute, but he was able to fill all of them. But yeah, so man, jeez, I, I don't blame him for just covering it up. Why, why rack your brain trying to figure out what the hell? But uh, thanks for sharing that, Glenn. I'm sure, I'm sure it sucked after putting in all that effort, man. All that hiking just to have that happen. But hey, it wasn't any worse than that. And uh, thanks for sharing that, Glenn. I appreciate it. Uh, anyone who's had an Alaskan experience who wants to share, um, they're not all terrifying. So most are just kind of mundane. Um, Alaskan Harry Man Project at gmail.com or nocomp907 at gmail.com. Um, thanks again for sharing, Glenn. It was a pleasure talking to you on the phone. You got my number. Hit me up next time you're up this way. And uh, until the next one.